there are General of the Army, Douglas A. MacArthur, made many speeches in his lifetime. In moments of triumph, in moments of anguish, in moments of good humor. You will hear them as the general, in his own words, traces his life through two wars and across three continents. What is the measure of a man? This soldier, do you measure him by medals and ribbons? General Douglas MacArthur won more decorations than any other officer in the history of the United States Army. Do you measure him by scholastic ability? Cadet Douglas MacArthur graduated from West Point with the highest average in the history of the military academy. Do you measure a man by achievement? In the Pacific Campaign in World War II, General Douglas MacArthur took more territory with less loss of life than any military genius since Darius the Great. And yet, this same man, six years later, was relieved of his command in Korea by President Truman. On Sunday, April 5, 1964, General Douglas A. MacArthur died at the age of 84. Yet, even after death, his life is the cause of controversy. Let us measure General Douglas MacArthur by his own words. Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying points. Douglas MacArthur was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, January 28, 1880. Perhaps his destiny was dictated by birth. His father, Lieutenant General Arthur MacArthur, was the first military governor of the Philippines. There was no question that Douglas MacArthur was to be a soldier, and he enrolled in West Point in 1899. If he had any lodestar in his life other than duty, honor, country, it was the United States Military Academy on the plains of West Point. Always, I come back to West Point. Always, there are echoes and re-echoes of the call and the call and the call. From his graduation in 1903, Douglas MacArthur rose steadily in his chosen profession. And with the outbreak of World War I, he was chosen by General Pershing as Chief of Staff of the famous Rainbow Division. A major in that same division was a man by the name of Harry S. Truman. At the end of World War I, General MacArthur once again found himself at his beloved West Point as superintendent of the academy. The war was over. Peace and prosperity seemingly lay ahead. The world had been made safe for democracy, and the war to end all wars had been fought and won. Once again, we go to the words of the man for the measure of the man. The soldier, above all of the people, prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. But always in our ears ring the ominous words of Plato, that wisest of all philosophers. Only the dead have seen the end of war. The general left West Point and was called to Washington as chief of staff. And in 1932, in the heart of the Depression, he crushed the bonus march on Washington. Duty, honor, country. General Douglas MacArthur was obeying orders. But for the first time, there were rumblings of disapproval. 
Five years later, in 1937, the general married a beautiful young lady named Jean Faircloth. The future seemed bright indeed. The clouds of the Depression had lifted, and General MacArthur was in the Philippines, where his presence had been requested by the Philippine people as military governor. And then... Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Outnumbered, outgunned, and outmanned, General Douglas MacArthur fought a desperate but losing battle to hold the Philippines and retreated to Bataan Peninsula on January 10, 1942, where he announced that Japan held the bottle, but he held the cork. With no room to maneuver, cut off from all sources of supplies, lacking air cover and under continuous and heavy bombardment from the enemy, the situation was hopeless. And in March 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt ordered General MacArthur and his family to Australia. And he obeyed. For first and foremost, he was a soldier. A soldier. Just what is the measure of a soldier? What sort of soldiers are those you are to lead? Are they reliable? Are they brave? Are they capable of victory? Their story is known to all of you. It is the story of the American man-at-arms. The United States and its allies had seen the enemy strike in every direction like a giant octopus. Manila, Midway, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, but in Australia, MacArthur brought life to a way of life. Two years ago, when I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Yeah. Tonight, I repeat those words. Yeah. 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 I shall return. On October 20, 1944, General Douglas MacArthur, with an armada of ships and troops and sufficient air cover, returned to the Philippines. And at Leyte Gulf, with President Osmena, he fulfills his promise. Mr. President, all of us my dear friends, I have returned. Once again, in this land that I have known so long, and amongst this people that I have loved so well. And the tide had turned. Victory was on the march. February 3, 1945, Manila is freed. March 1, Corregidor reoccupied. General Douglas MacArthur had returned. I see that the old flag staff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down. The high point in MacArthur's life takes place on September 2, 1945. On board the aircraft carrier Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Bay. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese Imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. And the Japanese government 
from the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters are to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. That was September 2, 1945, VJ Day, four months after VE Day, the end of World War II. The United Nations were to be born. And in a triumphantly successful administration of the U.S. post-war occupation of Japan, General MacArthur showed his ability to heal the wounds of war. June 25, 1950. 60,000 North Korean troops spearheaded by over 100 Russian-built tanks invaded South Korea. Seoul, its capital, falls on June 29. And when President Truman was requested by the United Nations to name a commander for what was termed a police action, he selected General MacArthur. This sneak attack far more infamous than was the Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor was surreptitiously launched in defiance of all internationally recognized obligations of a war declaration before initiating belligerency. History repeated itself. The general found himself outnumbered and outsupplied, but President Truman sounded the call. The battlefield situation is uncertain at this time. We may suffer reverses as we have suffered them before, but the forces of the United Nations have no intention of abandoning their mission in Korea. Once again, General MacArthur felt that he saw his duty. In war, there is no substitute for victory. If you lose, the nation will be destroyed. Like the Philippines, General MacArthur was facing tremendous odds. But unlike Bataan, he had room to maneuver. And on September 15, he conceived the Marine landing at Incheon, 150 miles behind the North Korean troops. With the help of this remarkable tactic, one of the most brilliant ever conceived, the United Nations Police Force, spearheaded by the United States Army 7th Division, on the 20th of November, reached the Manchurian border and the Yalu River. Many centuries ago, Julius Caesar reached the Rubicon, the river of decision. Perhaps every military genius has had his Rubicon. General MacArthur had assured President Truman that the Chinese would not enter the war. He was wrong. On November 26, 200,000 Chinese Communist volunteers crossed the Yalu River and drove 70 miles south into Korea. It wasn't until April that UN troops under the command of MacArthur pushed the Chinese back and stopped an offensive to which 600,000 Chinese were now committed. And then, on April 11, 1951, General MacArthur was removed from his command and replaced by General Matthew B. Ridgway. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. It was with, with the deepest personal regret that I found myself compelled to take this action. The general and his wife returned to this country and landed in San Francisco, where he received a hero's welcome at the San Francisco airport. I can't tell you how good it is to be home. For long, long, dreary years, Mrs. MacArthur and myself have talked and thought about this moment. But now that it's come, the marvelous hospitality and the wonderful reception that this great city has given us has made it seem even more delightful than we had anticipated. Thanks, we'll not forget it. How do you measure a man? 
A joint session of Congress was called to inquire as to whether General MacArthur had disobeyed orders. The Senate inquiry found that he was not charged with insubordination, but had disregarded the President's order to clear policy statements through the Defense Department. Speaking before Congress, General MacArthur retires. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plane at West Point and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballot, I now close my military career and just fade away. After retiring from the Army and becoming chairman of the board of Remington Rand, General MacArthur found himself much in demand as a speaker, and we hear a mellower side of this man. At a football foundation dinner in December 1959, he recalls a Harvard-Yale football game. I can still remember a remark of President Theodore Roosevelt made to me more than 50 years ago when I was his aide comp on the day of the Harvard-Yale game. Douglas, he said, I would rather be in the Harvard backfield today than be in the White House. <laughs> and at the same dinner reveals a little known story about Calvin Coolidge. And President Calvin Coolidge, when I took him to an Army Notre Dame game at the old polo grounds here in New York and told him of my earnest support of football as a builder, not only of body, but of basic character and as a cardinal means towards furthering our traditional competitive spirit with his dry comment. Well, I'm glad such players are not all Democrats. <laughs> and then the general shows a typical American characteristic, the ability to laugh at oneself. And President Harry Truman surely tried to look like a fullback when he kicked me out of Korea. <laughs> but the country, its people, and its leaders had not forgotten the general because on August 16, 1962, then Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, presenting a certificate of appreciation to General Douglas MacArthur, had this to say. A man of extraordinary intellect, a public servant with a dedicated lifetime in the public service, one whose prose is always eloquent and whose voice is always strong. We shall never forget the tragic moment of this nation's history in a moment of defeat and retreat, when the general with eloquence and clarity and determination and strength said, I shall return, and did. Douglas MacArthur accepted, but not for himself alone. I am grateful to the American men at arms who are my comrades in the vital exploits involved. A general is just as good or just as bad as the troops under his command make him. Mine were great. I am grateful to the citizens of this powerful republic 
who accorded me opportunities challenging memorable results. They sent me to West Point. They gave me a chance to battle for my country. They placed me in command positions where the nation's destiny, to some extent, was in my hands. My thanks are deeper than any words can convey. I am grateful above all to Almighty God who has so often guided me through the shadows of the valley of death and who has nerved me in my hours of lonely vigil and deadly decision. In 1961, General MacArthur met with a man who had served under him in the Pacific and who was then President of the United States. The General had this to say about John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He seemed to be in excellent health and excellent spirits and has changed little since he was one of my PT boat commanders in the Pacific War. He was a good one too. A brave and resourceful young naval officer. Judging from the luncheon served me today, he's living higher now. <laughs> <laughs> we have heard the words of General Douglas MacArthur. We have followed his army career through two wars. And now, on May 12, 1962, he visits West Point for the last time. A poignant moment in his life, but not without humor. As I was leaving the hotel this morning, a doorman asked me, Where are you bound for, General? And when I replied West Point, he remarked, Beautiful place. Have you ever been there before? <laughs> and later that same day, the general makes his farewell address to the cadets assembled before him. The shadows are lengthening for me. The twilight is here. My days of old have vanished. Tone and tint. They have gone glimmering through the dreams of things that were. Their memory is one of wondrous beauty, watered by tears and coaxed and caressed by the smiles of yesterday. I listen vainly, but with thirsty ear for the witching melody of faint bugles blowing reveille, a far drum beating the long road. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry, the strange, mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, Always, I come back to West Point. Always, there echoes and re-echoes duty, honor, country. Today marks my final roll call with you. 
But I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last conscious thoughts will be of the core and the core and the core. I bid you farewell. Duty, honor, country. This was the measure of the man.